Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. What's going on guys? This is Rob and we are picking back up again with uh, Dark Side War. And in this instance, we're covering the Shazam one shot when Billy Batson gets a new pantheon of gods. Now, here's a crazy thing about this, right? This was probably one of the most anticipated and exciting things to come out of Dark Side War. And for those of you guys who are new to comic books, this is usually how it works, right? If you guys are familiar with comics, that's awesome. Bear with me here for a minute while we kind of get people who are not really familiar with comics caught up. So usually when it comes to a particular character or team, more often than not, uh, publishers, or at least it used to be this way, publishers would use like big landmark events as a way to kind of reshuffle and, and change things. More recently, it just kind of changes based on any one new particular writer, right? They just kind of introduce a story arc, shift things up, and then some kind of change gets made that just gets carried on from that point going forward. With Dark Side War, this is one of the instances when DC was just kind of like, let's change things up for Shazam, right? Let's shift things around and let's, let's introduce like a new pantheon of gods. Right now, it's as, it's as good a time as any. And so what we ended up getting was that during the main Dark Side War event, following the death of Dark Side, there was this kind of ripple effect that was sent throughout essentially the, the realm of the gods. And the result of this is that Billy Batson lost his connection to the old gods, Mercury and, and Zeus and, and so on and so forth, you know, Solomon and whatnot. And he was replaced, or it really was replaced with a with a new god. And even then, even inside of this, it's called the Six Gods of Antiquity, Antique Gods. That's kind of what they're referred to as. Now, when this happens, there's this kind of huge influx of all these different voices voices that come pouring into his head because for the most part there is new to this as he is right they're not really sure why they're bound to him and he's not really sure where these new gods came from it's suddenly just this huge influx of voices from all these various beings he's discovering new powers the ability to manipulate what's called the living fire as opposed to simply just being the the living lightning in a traditional sense and so it leads to them kind of goading him on and almost kind of just being like you know shout the word right you know say shazam different things like that and ultimately he initially does but then suddenly he's whisked away basically to the source. Now, the way that DC explains this is that gods in DC comics never actually die. Instead, they're basically taken to the source. Now, the important thing to understand here, this is kind of a Jack Kirby thing, but kind of not. Uh, the reason why I say that is, is back in the 70s, when Jack Kirby left Marvel and then went to DC comics, he had his whole fourth world, right? The idea of Jack Kirby doing that, to kind of sidetrack from this for a second, the idea of Jack Kirby introducing like Darkseid and all those guys and the old, the old uh, fourth world comics was to create like a wholly separate publication that didn't really have anything to do with the mainline DC comics. Kind of what you see now with like Vertigo, right? It's like Lucifer and like the Spectre, things like that. Spectre crosses over more often than not, but you've never really seen a story where like Superman and Wonder Woman and the Justice League have to like align themselves with Lucifer Morningstar to face off against some kind of threat. Uh, but the idea with the fourth world was to make it wholly separate and unique. And the source was a part of that and all that kind of good stuff. The whole thing behind this is that following him leaving DC, all the fourth world stuff was rolled over into the main DC universe which is why you have Darkseid as part of like the, the New 52 or you had Darkseid even before that who would face off against Superman and things along those lines. But the idea of gods dying and going to the source was a concept that Jack Kirby had thought of, but not one that was routinely used. And in fact, it really wouldn't be until Neil Gaiman's Eternals in Marvel Comics that that concept by Jack Kirby was actually used more prominently when you figured out that's where the Celestials go. That when Celestials in Marvel Comics die, they go to a kind of afterlife for the Celestials. They rejoin, quote unquote, Marvel's version of the source. That's kind of rolled over here, right? So it's one of those things where it was kind of created by DC, but not really, never, never really used. Then it was used by Marvel, then it was used by DC, but it all really kind of roots back to Jack Kirby, which is why he's considered to be one of the most landmark people out there. But what DC basically establishes here is that the old gods that Shazam was previously tied to are not really dead. They simply just rejoin the source. And at some point along the line, it basically opens the door for them to return in some form or fashion. So like Solomon, Hercules, Atlas, Zeus, Achilles, Mercury, they're not really tied to, uh, to Shazam anymore. Instead, he's got a whole new pantheon. But the crazy thing about this is that when Steve Orlando wrote this, it was designed to kind of springboard into a new series of Shazam stories. And a lot of that was because Shazam's comics is as interesting as he was and as hardcore as his fan following is, even they would have to admit the biggest problem with Billy Batson is the stories run stagnant, that they don't really 
do a lot with his character. He's there, but the last time he really had anything great was during the early 90s when you learned that like when he turns into Shazam, he turns into what he he remembers his father looking like or what he what he imagines his father to look like or something along those lines. But like that's it, right? There really haven't been a lot of meaningful moments behind Billy Batson. And so this was kind of designed to say, okay, well, let's just get rid of his old gods, replace them with new gods, and then go from there. And so what we're basically told is that in this interim moment, like this this split moment of a second between the time that, that Darkseid died and the time that Billy was given these new these new abilities, that time was kind of frozen to a degree, that it works differently when it comes to gods, but the idea is that the old gods were removed, the new gods were put in, but it was an incomplete process. That the wizard Shazam was the one who started it, but before the transition could be completed, that a villain named Zonus had basically struck, and he was kind of going through the process of essentially eliminating or taking over all these old gods, and then kind of empowering himself. And what we're basically told is that before Darkseid or any of those guys, there was just like this, this kind of butcher, right? This, this primal inspiration for suffering, right? He's basically given to us as like the original incarnation of evil. Now, again, this is not really designed to stand alongside Vertigo. It's designed to stand kind of alone from Vertigo, right? So that's why you don't really see any correlation here with regards to how this guy Zonas compares to like Lucifer Morningstar or something like that. Just no real, there's, DC does, just doesn't really cross those things over too much. But the idea is that Shazam having this new level of power would basically put him in a position to overpower Zonas, right? To kind of confine him back to where he's supposed to be. And so in the midst of that conversation, when he's talking to this woman, uh, Annapel, you know, as part of his new pantheon, suddenly he's yanked away and he ends up coming into uh, this guy who basically refers to himself as Siva, the dancer of destruction. And each one of these instances, each one of these gods that he comes across with kind of gives him a little, a little more of a piece of the puzzle, right? That in the sense that where Zonus had kind of gone on this campaign of, of cruelty and whatnot, that ultimately he was defeated, right? And when he was defeated, his cruelty was replaced with his son's cruelty, that his son became, you know, equally cruel to him. And so the result to this is that when he's met with these new powers, they kind of question him whether or not he could actually use these powers effectively, whether he could channel these abilities in the right way to actually defeat Zonus. Like, does this kid have the power to pull that off? But before he's really able to provide any credible evidence to the fact that he can do this outside of, you know, don't question what it is that I'm capable of. If that's, if you guys really see me as just some common mortal, then none of you really understand what I'm about. Then suddenly he's yanked away. And then he's brought to the presence of a woman by the name of Eight, who's the goddess of impulse. And the way she kind of explains her here is really intriguing. She really establishes the idea that where the other people lend him particular abilities, she lends him a concept, right? She lends him the idea of being impulsive. And this could be looked at as a bad thing, but not necessarily. And the reason why is because whenever two foes go into conflict with each other, there's this kind of expectation in terms of how things will play out, right? In the sense that Zonus kind of being this ancient evil that is basically returned would look at Billy Batson in a lot of ways underestimate him, right? Or at the very least say, okay, if you're empowered by these gods that I'm familiar with, and knowing those gods as I do, I would expect you to act something in the same fashion because why else would they give you their powers? And even then he would look at him as simply just being an earthling and say, okay, as a person from earth, I can expect you to act like most earthlings. Impulsiveness kind of grants this sort of distraction, right? This idea that, you know, it kind of throws them off guard. Like, well, what is he going to do next? That kind of a thing. Acting in an impulsive manner. And even then it's kind of expanded to a degree, right? The idea that, you know, this, this offering that she brings him could be something that could distract him from the beating he's going to get. Now, she's not really saying that insofar as, a, as something being beneficial. She's kind of saying it from the perspective of like, you're probably going to get wrecked, right? So not really having a whole lot of faith in him. But again, before he's able to kind of explain it to her, before he's able to offer any real indication of what it is that he's about, he's suddenly yanked away again. And he's almost brought to the to this guy who looks very similar to what we'd expect from like Surtur or even like Hephaestus from Greek mythology. Now he calls himself Ronmir, which he kind of says like, there is nobody else out there like me. Now the truth about this is he grants him what's called the living fire, which is more or less something akin to the living lightning. We didn't really, we don't really know the full effect of what his fire can do, the full on like level of durability and, and you know, how it compares to something like hellfire or something along those lines, because of course he's yanked away. And then suddenly he's brought before the wizard Shazam, who's facing off against Zonas. That with Zonas being free, that now he's going through and trying to take out each one of these individual gods. Now, when he shows up here, Billy, of course, watches the wizard get into this conflict. And then Zonas reveals his true nature in saying 
that he's basically Yuga Khan, right? The sire of evil, that he's the actual father of Darkseid. Now, this is not the first time that we've seen Yuga Khan in DC Comics. He existed long before this, but, but you know, the last time we'd previously seen him, he was locked away in the source wall. So presumably he had managed to find some way to escape. Now, the fact that he's here is one of these things where it's kind of like he intends to use his power combined with the powers of the other gods, presumably through Billy Batson, to basically raise the world and kind of sees his son as a failure, right? The idea that like he's picking up where Darkseid left off, that Darkseid was just not strong enough to be able to overtake the world. He wasn't strong enough to be able to overtake Earth superheroes, but that Yuga Khan himself can. Now, the idea behind this was to kind of, again, springboard into like new stories that could be told coming in the aftermath of Darkseid War. And initially, like he just kind of takes off, right? Headed towards Earth. Now, Billy Batson, of course, transforms into the Wizard of Shazam and brandishing the power of these new gods that he possesses goes toe to toe with Yuga Khan and is able to actually overpower him. Just by the, the strength, speed, durability, all that kind of stuff, he's able to overpower him. Even when you have Yuga Khan who's playing mind games and saying like, nothing you do can stop me and I will take your friends and I will put them in the kilns and you will watch them burn and you will smell them as they die. Like just all these, these horrible things that he's putting inside of his head. At the end of the day, none of it matters. And he's still able to present himself as the earth's mightiest mortal. Now, that's the point that Billy was trying to get across to all these new gods who questioned whether or not he would have the ability to overcome somebody like Yuga Khan and saying that the beauty of humanity is that we're not inherently limited, that a lot of races out there or a lot of beings out there may be confined to this kind of worldview or this view of their existence or something like that. And in that limitation, they quite literally cannot think outside the box, but humans are driven and powered by their imagination and the things that come with it. And so because of that, Billy doesn't really see any limits to his power. And it's one of these rare instances when you see him almost kind of like a, a level of power that seemingly has no real limit. Now, the reason why I say that is because there are big differences between the powers that Billy had before and the powers he has now. A lot of them are still the same, having like super strength and like super speed and things like that, right? The lightning of Mamoragon, that's, the, that's not really a huge difference in what we saw before, but having this kind of boldness that comes from eight, right? The ability to manipulate the power of the source, which came from Zonas, having the ability to manipulate the fires of Ronmir. This was all brand new stuff, but no matter how you slice it, the result is that he overpowers Yuga Khan and then essentially knocks him out. And so when that happens, we have a couple things that happen. The first is that we learn the actual name of the wizard Shazam, who says his name's Mamoragon, right? So this is kind of a big reveal when it first happened. And that Mamoragon was basically the fifth god that Billy was getting his powers from. The sixth source of his power came from Yuga Khan himself. But the important takeaway from all this is that Billy basically had a new source of power that he could use in stories going forward. The downside of this is we never really saw anything come of it, right? Because Dark Side War ended and then DC Comics almost immediately picked up with the events of Rebirth and just kind of blew all this off, right? So Dark Side War was just kind of ignored seemingly across the board outside of reference to the fact that it happened. We didn't really see anything from Billy Batson outside of him showing up in like a Constantine comic, maybe some Wonder Woman stories, but nothing of any real significance to give us this idea that like Steve Orlando's vision of catapulting into like a new era of storytelling, focusing on Shazam with a whole new level of power. We never got to see that, right? Which is really disappointing when you think about it because it was a way to just breathe fresh life into a character who for quite some time has seemingly just kind of become stagnant. But with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comments Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Core. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.